Welcome to episode two, a continuation of last week's episode. Years before the paper bag test officially started, years before Dr. Kenneth and Dr. Mamie Clark did the the, the um, doll test, which um, resulted in victory dealing, dealing with Brown versus Board of Education, Dunbar High School then the M Street Colored School denied a, a graduate of their school the opportunity to come back and teach at the school because of her African features. And all she did is go down the street to the other section of the city and start her own school. Become a Prime member today by visiting ilovebladpeople.com and receive a free I Love Black People t-shirt, Black Survival Guide, and become a part of our I Love Black People network, which comes with a global safety toolkit, nomad health insurance, Pan-African certification classes, and so much more. Go to ilovebladpeople.com now. Which was 50 years before the March of yeah, can, can you repeat that? Can you repeat what you said, the and, reason why you started to play? The reason that we did the play is because we, we broke it down into different segments of historical significance. So um, one of the scenes is of Nanny Helen Burroughs trying to get um, applying to teach at Dunbar High School, her alma mater. So if you know how Nanny Helen Burroughs looks, she has strong African features. You could throw her right in the middle of Namibia. You could throw her in Zimbabwe. You could throw her in Burkina Faso. You could throw her in Burundi and she'd blend right in. And if she didn't open her mouth and speak colonial language, my English, when people have spoke to her, they would have spoke to her in Shona, spoke to her in Debele, spoke to her in Mugamo, spoke to her in Igbo. But so when she went to apply to go to Dunbar, the school where she was on the National Honor Society, the school where she started a literary society, they denied her an application because they said her skin was too dark. So, um, so we highlighted that. We highlighted 1913, the suffrage parade, where um, Mary Church Terrell showed up with some young sisters from your alma mater, Harvard University. And once they got there, they were told by the white liberal, those white liberal women of the day, your place in this march is at the back of the march. So the suffrage woman's march was a segregated march. We had to get to the back. And when you know Ida B. Wells' history, one of the things that the Women's Christian Temperance Union did to destroy her, they seek to destroy her because she wouldn't put down the struggle against lynching, which was the forefront issue for Africans at that historical moment. They said she needed to become um, the African voice of the suffrage movement, so she would be a mouthpiece for the suffrages suffragists, these white women who she had nothing in common with, these white women who if she went to their house, she couldn't walk in the front door. And if she came in their house, they would give her an apron so she could wash their dishes or give her a brush so she could clean their toilets. And they were telling her that she should focus more on that than focus on our people being hung from trees by their husbands, by their uncles, by their fathers, by their grandfathers. So at different points of this play, we were highlighting these key issues. Her, the fact that Harriet Tubman was a founding member of this organization in her twilight years, because we know that we reduced her to the Underground Railroad the way we reduce Dr. King to his I Have a Dream speech, or we reduce Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois to the souls of black folk, or we reduce Dr. Carter G. Woodson to the miseducation of the Negro. So the fact that we reduced Araminta Ross or Harriet Tubman to the Underground Railroad and not even let you know that she was part of an organization is powerful. We get excited if we see the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and Jesse Jackson sharing a platform together and hear these women of that stature were forming an organization where they were all members, humble to be around each other, humble to be comrades with each other, humble to create an organization with the same mission and the same objectives and the same goals. So we thought that this was an eye opener for young girls in particular. And of course, through this process of the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company, we don't teach our history to our people. We don't teach our history to our children. We teach it through our children. So when they go home and they show mama what they're learning, when they show dad what they've learned, when they show grandma and grandpa what they've learned, and when they found out that grandma and grandpa, and mom and dad, and uncle and auntie never learned this history in the classroom, never learned this history in the community, they recognize that they have just as much of a capacity to teach and stimulate and cultivate and nurture the community as the adults do. That's how we approach decolonization, Brother Sinclair. Well, you know what? I think what's interesting as we come to a close, you know, and again, in the space that 
uh, we're operating in um, with technology and, and scaling and creating opportunities for to engage our people globally in ways that we couldn't do uh, in many ways prior to this uh, technical moment, if you could call it that. How, I mean, it seems like uh, as we look at uh, how uh, entertainment and how media is used to maintain a colonial model, the the work you're doing with these plays, how could someone in uh, Kapala, Uganda, or somebody in uh, Indianapolis, uh, United States, how could they get access to the opportunity the, the to last, do the play? No, no, the to, do the, to actually do the plays. Let me just say this. Okay. Not just to watch the play. What seems so powerful about the point you're making is not, it's not just about consuming it but actually giving us the exposure where now you have people acting it out. I think the intensity and the intimacy of what you're doing, and it really didn't strike me until now that we were on this interview, but literally the intimacy and the intensity of actually being an actor, acting out something, as opposed to just being an audience member, viewing something, it's, it's, it's not as intense, but it seems like what you're doing and this might make a, a serious uh, tech app, if you literally could have young people or anybody, let's just say anybody who wanted to be in acting and mm -hmm. wanted to uh, emerge themselves into a moment, uh, a moment that was a, a revolutionary moment or any moment, right. for our folks, a revolutionary moment, and they have to get in character. And again, I, you know, I'm not in entertainment, so I don't know what that really means, but I've heard it a few times, so I'm saying that again. But to actually say that I'm now going to act out as these people, and it's not just a Halloween, Halloween uh, costume, or Halloween, but literally us manifesting it, how does somebody who doesn't physically know you physically uh, involved in the areas where you're recruiting and having these rehearsals and whatnot, how could somebody... Or do you have a repository of these plays yes. in a way that could ha actually help people actually perform these plays? That's super powerful. Um, okay. Um, during the corona pandemic last year, we were robbed of the opportunity of um, having a play performed by children in Haiti. We did a play called um, Dim Parsley, which was about the 1934 Parsley Massacre that was actually carried out in the Dominican Republic. Of course, you know about that. Yeah, I do uh, know. Yes, you do. Um, we've we've had a play. We did a play a few years ago called 1925, which was about the childhood of Brother Malcolm, the childhood of Patrice Lumumba, and the childhood of France Fanon, all born in 1925, which was performed by some youth in the Congo. Um, there are some young people at the People's School in Ghana, which the whole curriculum is modeled after the books of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. The only school in Ghana doing that, by the way, right now. And the principal is our old comrade, Akili Seka. Um, they're interested in doing some of our material. Um, there are some people interested in doing a play in some plays in Guyana. And um, we are on the verge of signing a memorandum of understanding with La Colmanita, which is the National Ch Children's Theater Ensemble in Cuba, which has been an ongoing conversation for the last few years because we're the first children's troupe outside of Cuba to do a children's play about their doctors called Cuba's Greatest Army, which was followed up by our children creating a documentary um, last year um, called Get Out of Cuba's Way, which was done in eight minutes and 30 seconds. So while it took terrorist police eight minutes and 40 seconds to kill George Floyd, it took our babies eight minutes and 32 seconds to make a play calling for Cuban medical personnel to come to the United States to eradicate the corona pandemic. So um, it, people can take a look at the catalog of the plays. They can look at which one would apply to the situation where they are. And um, we're even willing to uh, write a play and make a parallel. Like for example, um, we're gonna do a play um, next year. We, we just did the layout and it's called Bloody on Sundays. And it's, everybody knows about Bloody Sunday in Selma, but not many people know that in Grenada, 
the New Jewel Movement under the leadership of Maurice Bishop, a few years after what happened in Selma, they had a bloody Sunday and they were marching against police terrorism too. So we'll do a play showing the parallels between Grenada and Selma. So no, we, we've been doing, and then you remember, um, I believe you were there. You came to my son's um, welcoming ceremony. We did a play called Araminta and Samora, Treating the Sick, Liberating the Oppressed. And it was about the parallels between the life of Harriet Tubman and Samora Marshall, Mozambique's first president. For those of you, who, for your listeners who are going to hear this who don't know, Samora Marshall was a nurse before he joined the Mozambican Revolution. And his first political activity was protesting against the difference, disparity in pay of Mozambican nurses and Portuguese nurses. And uh, Harriet Tubman was a nurse. And Samora Marshall's middle name is Moises, which is how you say Moses in Portuguese. So you have two liberators named Moses and two nurses. And a man can be a nurse, too. And also, when Mozambique started their guerrilla struggle, Brother Sinclair, of course, as you know, their base was in Tanzania. So they designed an escape route from Maputo to Dar es Salaam, modeled after the Underground Railroad. Go ahead. So it is through these ways that we give that information to these children. So when we're talking to people, right, we'll we'll hear we'll listen to them talk about their concerns with narrative, their their concerns with particular eras of history, and based on that, we'll give them one of our plays and say maybe this one will work for you. And um, what we've been able to do is we have to go back and rewrite some of our old material to make it more theater friendly. So I've been trained by one of the daughters of Amiri Baraka, Maria Jones in that area, because in the beginning we were just doing that, who am I? Which is your introduction to that. You give the, over, the historical overview of a historical figure and people, and then you mention who you're talking about. So that's how we began, but now we got plots, we got settings, we got themes, as you began to see. So, yeah, we're fine. So um, this actually is going to become the next wave in the decolonization process. And the beautiful thing about it, for all these movies in Hollywood, while we're happy to see them, you see the crippling paradigm of people who do not treat natural science I mean, social science with the same courtesy that they treat natural science or math. So they just interpret things the way they feel. They don't give a damn about accuracy. Some are even bold enough before their movies come on or their television shows come on. They let you know that they're plagued with fictionalism, distortion. So what we're doing is we're dealing with the historical accuracy of historical moments of historical breakthroughs, in addition to making it entertaining and stimulating and exciting. Now, I think this is awesome. And if they, if the listeners would like to get in contact with you, what, uh, how could they do so? Um, at Junior Egbuna, which is the Twitter um, email, um, O-B-I-E-G-B-U-N-A, one five at gmail.com instagram um at obi at buna 20. that surprises right. you the twitter and instagram doesn't it yeah <laughs> I, love, I love that social media present yeah so, <laughs> awesome so through that awesome. so through that that's that's the way and um our goal is to start branches of the mass emphasis children's and history theater company all over the place however if you have a theater ensemble that is moving in this direction, then we'll have a partnership with you. And then every time that we perform, you can perform and we'll bring attention to your efforts. But let me just close by talking about the mass emphasis on uh, positive action and creativity youth brigade. One of the other things that we've gotten away from brother Sinclair is people organizing util um, through their skills and their talents. Ida B. Wells used her journalism to organize. Daisy Bates used her journalism to organize. Emil Carl Cabral and George Washington Carver used their agronomy to organize. Nkrumah used his teaching. Mugabe used his teaching to organize. Dr. King used his um, theology to organize. We have to get back to using our skills to organize. So um, what we do is we get these young people to develop projects based on their skill sets. Three years ago, we had two DJs, two brothers, Xavier um, Reed and um, Jabari Reed, 10 and 13 years old, with their sister Naomi Reed helping. They did a visual mixtape on Kwame Ture. 
which was our answer to the Black Power mixtape. So instead of going in the soapbox talking about what we felt was inaccurate, we felt we could do something. Um, last summer, 16-year-old Sia Lee Wright, 20-year-old Zion Utsi, and 21-year-old Jalen Mitchell did that mini doc calling for Cuban medical personnel to come to the country. A few years before that, Sia Lee Wright and her brother Rosef Wright, when they were 15 and 12, they did the documentary calling for our actors and actresses not to play police officers, military officers, and intelligence agents, which we talked about before. So what we do is we get these children based on their talents. And Zion Utsi did a rap cut, um, a poetry song called Vision, where he was paying homage to Cuba and Venezuela's efforts through a project called Operation Project Miracle, whose aim is to eradicate blindness in the Americas. What we did is we got them to um, do this. We got them to um, create projects based on their skills and based on their talents. So in addition to the theater company, we have that brigade. So for all the young people who are poets out there, for all the young people who can draw, for all the young people who can create videos, for all the young people who can sing, for all the young people who can dance, for all the young people who have this, these different talents, we can create projects centered around their talents and centered around their um, skill set. Now, you know, I, I think even, uh, and this is, again, l using the, the model of crowdsourcing and some of the kind of uh, innovative ways that people organize through through my background, engineering, it, it doesn't even have to be proper. No, no I'm not going to project. You know better than me. But what, what we've seen happen in such a rapid way is that even if you don't have a theater ensemble, Literally, your ability to, to empower people to take what you're building and all become a part of it. Like, literally, even when you just discussed the part about students in Haiti, young people in Haiti, like, literally, the, 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 the work that you're doing could be done by people of all ages anywhere. And if you know how they have what they call those things when they have a mob where they all do do a dance or something wild, something that again a lot of this stuff is trivial, a flash mob, right? Literally, with the stuff that you're doing, you could actually get people literally all over the world, and you could probably pick who and what, and even have rehearsals where you have all these folks come together, literally reciting, repeating, playing out roles. You could have somebody literally in uh you know johannesburg acting out one role while you got somebody in nairobi actually acting out with them and literally with the technology we have it could be a play with like five you know uh, 10 20 of the same actor and like you could like cut and put them together cut and paste and they all have different accents like what you're doing, bro, is just so like overwhelming. I'm like, whoa. Yeah, it's um, it, it the the direction is going in. I mean, it's very humbling, and at the same time, it can be intimidating because what you're talking about, um, by the end of the year, um, we're looking at December. We're looking at a play called um, "You Understand Exactly What I'm Saying," and it's about um, Paul Robeson and focusing on the fact that he was multilingual. So there's a possibility in that play, you'll see people, um, children, speaking in maybe four or five African languages, if we have our way, and Chinese, actually. So but, which he's even, which he spoken. No, but I'm saying, even, even what you're doing now, people mm -hmm. can take your plays and actually translate them into their local language Exactly. But still play them out and literally play them out at the same time. That's like you I'm literally can pick, it. you can really pick the bell and let the people, you don't have to pick. You can have the people say, oh, that guy or that sister was really hard. And then you can actually pull them all together and like, you know, oh my, what and, you're and doing the step, and empowering and the step, people and the is, step is awesome. Took, and the step we took towards that is um, in December, we did our first play in another language called the Key Swahili Explosion in recognition of Kwanzaa. And it was about the uh, 13 million homeless children in East Africa. So it was a group of children who got together in East Africa 
and calling on their blood extended bloodline in North America who celebrate Kwanzaa, but because they use the Kiswahili culture and language, they were calling for them to join them in the fight. And of course, we know in this country, even though we're 12 percent of the population, we're 43 percent of the homeless. So it is it's through those type of things. So you're right. So when people um, all over the country saw that play and saw these kids doing it in Kiswahili. And of course we had the subtitles up, they were surprised. And so based on that focus, children in Uganda can watch it, children in Rwanda can watch it, children in Tanzania can watch it, children in South Africa can watch it and say, okay, and they can go ahead and put it together. But you're correct, even if they can translate it, because matter of fact, but I'm not even talking about watching. That's what I'm saying. I think the part that you've mastered, that you're not, and maybe you're not saying it explicitly, it's not about just watching. Right, right, it's right. It's about acting. And, you know, we think about we, acting as something, but acting is action. Like, we don't even think about it because we talk about acting. And he's like, no, mm-hmm. we're talking about now giving people the power, empowering people to act out in ways that, that glorify, that uh, honor us in ways that they could literally use their own language like literally not even for the listener but for the actual participant to say i'm sick and tired of these things being said in other people's language this story meets me i'm gonna say it out loud in my language because this moment that's being like you said there's so many parallels and literally they could draw parallels like it's so organic what you're talking about what you're empowering the way you're connecting is almost like jazz like folks that come mm. up with their own riffs on some yeah. cool stuff Most and take definitely. a place that you there's, could never like, like no, because wow. we see it we see it all the time and the thing that is so um humbling about it right is when most people come and see the performances at the end you know you're wondering if there's an applause or you're anticipating the applause, but sometimes the overwhelming majority of the time, honesty compels me to say it's silence, but it's not because of a lack of appreciation, but people genuinely cannot believe what they just had the opportunity to absorb. When you're watching eight year olds and nine year olds and 10 year olds, so comfortable with the content, so expressive with the content, so innovative with the content, and you could tell that it's genuinely resonating with them. So you're witnessing decolonization happen right in front of you, a transformation happening right in front of you. So the first thing people ask, how old are they? How long did it take them to learn? And the average play since mass emphasis has been around, it takes us about a month and a half to do the intense um, rehearsing is about 45 days. Um, 60 days altogether, the first 15 days, you were just explaining the uh, significance of the play. But when no, they no, start getting no, into character... No, no, listen, listen. 60, that means 60 days, that means... Uh, that means six shows globally. You ma- I mean, I think... I mean, we, we'll, we'll talk more. I think, man... If, if you just presented this almost like, you know, I, I, we went back and forth talking about Clubhouse and these things. If you literally had a social media context where you have folks op- that chose to, to I want to be in the next play globally. Right. And the process that you're doing locally, if it was literally opened up globally mm-hmm. and then even had a context where people could use their own local language, and just be like again, just natural, being, the, yeah. yeah, 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 be natural and just the convening. The, the power is the organizing, like again, like you just said, organizing through your skills. And it's still organizing is something that not enough of us know how to do. Like you yeah. do it like it's nothing, but to be candid for many people, they do, they would like somebody to help facilitate. And that's what a lot of this tech is doing. And and this is where I think this is where you and I can connect because you're in and out of all these African nations in particular and Caribbean nations as well. So let's just identify some um, some uh, schools and some educators and some artists in those places. And let's just get to work, man. Let's do it. I already identified his name is Obi Igbuna Jr. And thank you, brother. We got to wrap it up, man. Thank We're going to probably try to take this maybe and make it a two-parter. 
uh, because of the length of time that we, we were able to with such good yeah, stuff. Yeah, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, right, yeah. So it'd be great to be able to see how we can do that. But more importantly, the work that you're doing, we're just so grateful and thankful. And I'm personally grateful and thank you for me and, and my family. And just continue and we keep you in prayer and, and, and may the spirits continue to guide you, brother. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, as we always end this, uh, with I am because we are we I, I am definitely because of good brother Obi. So thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. And y'all everyone have a great and a, amazing day. Right, thanks. Become a prime member today by visiting I love black people.com and receive a free I love black people t-shirt, black survival guide, and become a part of our I love black people network, which comes with a global safety toolkit, nomad health insurance, pan-African certification classes, and so much more. Go to iloveblackpeople.com now. Special thanks to Banneker Communities. Greetings. This is Nana Akua Zenzele, traditional healer, priest, and queen mother with more than 20 years of experience in natural healing. Today's helpful hint is about good food combining habits. As traditional healers, we know that how we combine our food is as important or even more important than the foods we eat. Avoid food combining practices that interfere with proper digestion. Today's tips are on not only what to eat, but how to eat them. Avoid combining protein-rich foods, high starch content foods, fats, sugars, or fruits at one meal. Avoid combining fruits and vegetables at one meal. Avoid combining sub-acid fruits with sweet fruits at one meal. Combine leafy green vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, and sprouts with only one other allowed category at one meal. This may take a little getting used to, but it will really aid in proper digestion and optimal health. Become a Prime member today by visiting iloveblackpeople.com and receive a free I Love Black People t-shirt, Black Survival Guide, and become a part of our I Love Black People network, which comes with a global safety toolkit, nomad health insurance, pan-African certification classes, and so much more. Go to iloveblackpeople.com now. Special thanks to Banneker Communities.